couple of things about the history that Josan is sketching out here in chapter one. First thing, in the history of philosophy, many of you know this who took modern philosophy with me, it's important to recognize that Kant is not engaging the scholastic tradition directly. Kant is engaging the Cartesian tradition that has replaced the scholastic tradition by his time. So we have We have this, so this, this first wave of modernity comes along. The Cartesian rationalism utterly destroys late scholasticism. Late scholasticism just uh, limps along, I suppose you could say. There, there are a couple of survivals, but as a going concern, it's gone, and rationalism owns basically the second half of the uh, 17th century. When Kant... When Kantian critical philosophy comes along, his philosophy of critique, his critique of pure reason in the late 18th century, it utterly obliterates rationalism. This is one of the, one of the uh, steps that Gilson is talking about in this chapter when he mentions his grounding of uh, physics and sensible intuition, which can't be accounted for by rationalist methods. So when we look, for, when we look at Kant's success, we look at it as a success over the then reigning rationalist system, okay, which Kant was earlier schooled in and uh, was, was converted from by, uh, by his reading of Hume, we might ask him, why hasn't scholast why isn't Kantianism engaged with scholasticism? Scholasticism is dead and buried for a century by the time that Kant comes along. So for those of you who are not aware of that historical progression, um, this is what in the modern in the modern class I call Cartesianism the first wave of modernity, which washes away most of the scholastic inheritance, such as it is, which has become sort of hollowed out and weakened. Um, and then second wave, I usually assign to empiricism, but I can incorporate that here into this. Second wave, Lockean empiricism. Third wave, Kant comes along. And Kant generally sort of owns the show uh, by the time that um, we get to the 20th century. So it's not unexpected that neo-scholastics in the early 20th century trying to think of, how can I make my peace with critical philosophy? Is there a way of recognizing what's true in it, its key insights, and incorporating them into a Thomist realist system of epistemology? Now, Jules says, Thomist, yes, realist, no. You can be a Kantian Thomist, but you can't be a Kantian Thomist realist, because Kantianism is, he thinks, idealistic right down to its core. So that's the first historical point I wanted to make. Um, <clears throat> The second point I think I can make by talking about the nature of critique, the nature of critical epistemology. We dealt with this way back in January when we were reading uh, chapter two, chapter one or two of uh, McInerney's book, right? Uh, so to come back to it again, anytime we're dealing with critical philosophy or um, the philosophy of critique, we're thinking about Kant historically. Um, this would not be the case from, uh, by something called critical theory, which is a late 20th century phenomenon. So you see the words critical theory together, that's something other than this. But critical philosophy or the philosophy of critique is the philosophy of Kant. And this is part of a general modern, part of a general modern turn to the subject of which Descartes also takes part. And you notice Descartes begins with the mind and its method and its limits rather than the object and its intelligibility. Right? He notes that this, is, uh, this has been neglected by prior epistemologies. This is the philosophy of epistemology that begins with the human mind, with the knowing subject, examines the nature and limits of the knowing subject and its capacity to know, <clears throat> the methods by which it knows, and most importantly, the limits of its knowledge. This critical philosophy is almost always a philosophy of limitation. The critique that it makes then of prior, say, scholastic philosophy or just the whole Aristotelian Platonic tradition is that that philosophy was insufficiently critical. Prior philosophy was uncritical. It ignored the limits of the human mind and claimed to have knowledge of supersensible realities, 
reference is one of uh, one of Kant's terms that comes up again. And so pre-critical, non-critical philosophy makes impossible knowledge claims. It claims to give us knowledge with certainty of realities of being that lie beyond the senses. It's the limit of the mind. is going to be importantly tied to sensible experience for Kant. Okay, and this is none, none of this is new to you guys. A lot of this is review, I trust, but I'm putting it down in this way for the sake of discussing it in Jilson. So we begin with the mind, we then work from the mind to what we can know. We have to be satisfied with a more limited scope for human knowledge, but But we do acquire, for Kant, certainty within those limits. Within that scope, we do have the certainty that we require. And this is his way of, of um, responding to the crisis initiated by Hume. Hume points out that our reasoning about matters of fact, about empirical matters, including science, the big, that's the big prize everybody's playing for. Scientific knowledge depends upon this assumption that can't be justified. So, it, so Hume opens this door to skepticism about the actual nature of our knowledge. So he thinks he can give us limits, but within those limits, certainty. This is what I've called in another course, Kant's gambit. What we give up is the ability ever to make true statements about being, considered just in itself, being in itself, things in itself, the noumenal, the queen sacrifice is knowledge of being. We, we cannot know being in itself, what he calls the noumenal. We just can't know that. All knowledge claims about noumenal realities are illusory, and they always have been. Nobody ever, not Aristotle, not Plato, not Descartes, not Spinoza, nobody has ever had that kind of knowledge. It has always been an illusion. Kant says is with critical philosophy, we've now woken up to that fact, and we're able to reform philosophy, pull back its frontiers quite significantly to within the limits of the powers of the human mind, limits dictated by experience, sensory experience. But within those limits, we can have absolute certainty because of the way that the mind is structured. This is Kant's new metaphysics as a, a science, okay, as, as, a, as a discipline, body of study. So the gain we gain a secure foundation for science, for scientific knowledge claims about phenomena. So we give up the noumena, but that's not actually giving up anything. It's giving up what we never actually had because knowledge of the noumena is, was, and always will be impossible. Now we reground our knowledge of science, of phenomena, on a solid foundation. Any questions before I erase this? I'm not quite sure from your faces how much of this is review and how much of this is new or shocking. Any other film? I don't know if we can answer this question now, mm -hmm. but um, Jill Song kind of implies that science, especially Kant, mm -hmm. um, through applying the like physical physics background mm -hmm. yeah. to everything limits it. But a lot of philosophers believe that science, like through coming to know the natural sciences, mm -hmm. you can come to know metaphysics, metaphysics better, like mm -hmm. um, Moses May, May Ma Ma Moses Maimonides. Maimonides. Yeah, things. Yeah. Like he said that and a couple others. So I don't, I don't know how that really fits in. Okay. Uh, is it, uh, I'm going to erase this to put some more stuff up. Phil? Can I erase this yeah. before answering your question? Okay. Um, so, for Kant, I mean, the, it, it's it's common to speak of pre-Kantian and post-Kantian metaphysics. That that's how much of a watershed figure he is. So maybe I can answer your question in this way. Maimonides, I think, is going to fall into that category of not insufficiently critical philosophies. So we're not going to get to any knowledge of being beyond the sensory experience. By any means, that's just not something we can know. We can have faith about that. We can have beliefs about that. We can have sort of 
speculative or regulative ideals. So I can think of the existence of God can be uh, an object of faith. It can be a regulative ideal that I employ in governing my behavior. I'm going to live my ethical life as though God exists. And thinking of God as existing as a supreme lawgiver helps me to internalize and act according to the genuine force of the moral law. But I can't claim to know that God exists. I can't claim that kind of knowledge. Knowledge is going to be restricted to this sphere of phenomena. So if you ask, sort of, what about Aquinas' five ways? Can't I observe the world and then use metaphysical principles to reason to the existence of unseen and unsensible beings? And Kant says no. no all, all proofs of God will fail. God can't be proved because God can't be known if he's a being that is not present to our sensible intuition. So pre-Kantian... Before Kant, we have what I call speculative metaphysics, which is an attempt to grasp, to know, to know the truth about being, being considered beyond us. This kind of speculation goes beyond, reaches out into the world. The object of post-Kantian metaphysics is descriptive. The goal is not to grasp the reality of something outside of ourselves. It's to grasp the actual nature of the working mind that is doing the know. So what I want to know is the truth about the structures of the human mind and the way those structures help to limit, structure, create experience and knowledge. So instead of asking about being, I'm asking about... conditions for the possibility of having any knowledge. You'll see this over and over again in Kant. We're not looking at the reality of the things. We can't get to that. We're looking at the conditions for the possibility of what we do know about it, what we do experience about it. And Kant thinks he can construct a working metaphysics on that basis, right? Or we're working epistemology, and then the metaphysics is sort of going to be consequent to that. Okay. So it all sort of holds together with this general with this general method. Does that answer your question? I sort of said, yeah. and the answer was no. Maimonides is not going to be able to arrive at any knowledge of God. Yeah. Right. If, if, if the conclusion of your argument is, therefore I have knowledge of a supersensible reality, your argument is invalid because your conclusion is false. Right? There can be no good argument that concludes that you have knowledge of something that's beyond the senses. All knowledge is either sensory knowledge, which can be physics, or... It's going to be this kind of descriptive metaphysical knowledge of the conditions for the possibility of physics. So metaphysics' job is to talk about how physics is possible. That's what philosophy is now. Okay, but it's going to be uh, sort of the, the uh, ancillary to science instead of to theology. Phil? Too long, I'm getting oh, you. No, 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 okay. What's the question? Okay, that's fine. Is that is it a joke? No, okay. Just, give me, right. give me a thumbs up. Or thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, so I need to wrap up the con lecture soon if we're going to talk about your song. Um, so the thing that it seems to me, the, the, the second point I want to make on the way to the way to making uh, that I've been on the way towards, is that it seems to me that the divide between sort of pre and post Kantian approaches to philosophy, we can also think of as a divide between living in a world of beings. and living in a world of experiences or sensations. Okay, so we might ask, so what, what populates the, our epistemology? What are these things that we are coming to know? And I think in, implicitly in Descartes and kind of finally in, in Kant, we shift from thinking about being surrounded by and analyzing different beings with which we interact to thinking instead of having different experiences, right, different mental events, different presentations through my senses or through my imagination or thought, right, experiences, thoughts, and the like, I have, to, I have to weigh up which ones of these are veridical or not, 
right? Which ones of these I should trust, which ones are going to count as true knowledge. So I need a sifting algorithm, right? This is what Descartes after with his method, right? How can I separate the true from the false purported knowledge claims, right? I'm not talking about being, I'm talking about the experiences I have or the beliefs that I have, and the experiences, the thoughts, etc. Notice these are all internal. And part of what Jolson is saying is if you begin in the mind, if you begin in a world of experiences, he doesn't think you're going to be able to fight your way back to a world of beings, not by immediate realism, not by the problem of the bridge, not in any way. If you want to have knowledge of being, you have to just sort of bite the bullet at the beginning and reject idealism at the start of your philosophical epistemology. You have to reject Descartes, reject idealism, reject Kant. You can't incorporate Kantian insights if it means starting in the subject. So part of what he says here is that accepting the Cartesian framing of the question is always going to lead you to a Cartesian answer. So this is his particular brand of neoscholasticism. There are others. And there, there is a sort of even today flourishing branch of Kantian-flavored Thomism. I think Bernard Lonergan probably falls into that category. So I could maybe introduce something by him late in the semester if you'd like to at least get a taste for what that looks like. But all of them represent an attempt to begin in the subject. They sort of take this modern turn to the subject as representing something true and valuable that needs to be recognized and responded to. And they might say, I'm a, I'm a Thomist, and Thomas made the best use of the true things that came before him. He took what was true in Aristotle and left what was false. If Thomas were alive in the 20th century, were able to read Kantian philosophy, he would say, Kant's onto something. I need to modify my system in order to uh, in incorporate this truth about the priority of the knowing subject. Gilson says, no, no, that's a mistake. Okay. That's a lot of what this chapter is about. The sort of inside baseball stuff is what's the right way to be a Thomist and still a realist. And Gilson's taking the no compromise line. Right? You can't, you can't begin on this side of the line and hope to cross back over and draw conclusions on this side of the line. Now he might be wrong about that. It might be possible to cross over. I haven't given you anything by Noel or any of the other people he's criticizing. We might look into those later on. Or as I might give you guys some resources if somebody you want to investigate yourselves. So that's my sort of preliminary review, I think, of Kant and critical philosophy. It's sort of the, the, the table set, get an idea of what the battle space is like here.